Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Jenny Laramore. I'm the Director of Brand Management and Trademark Licensing here at Idaho State University. Uh, but today, I'm very happy to be the host of this town hall. So welcome to the COVID-19 Faculty and Staff Town Hall. This session is intended to answer questions related to COVID-19 protocols and the fall semester. Many faculty and staff across campus have been working diligently since the spring semester to prepare the university to be open as safely as possible. While the university cannot totally eliminate the risk associated with COVID-19, extensive measures have been put in place to protect our Bengal community. The COVID-19 protocols and measures have all been carefully developed based on CDC guidance in close coordination with our local health department. This has been a heavy lift, but we have responded as comprehensively as possible. There are still some pending important communications that will be coming out this week, and we would ask you to look for these when they come out. Later this week, information will be disseminated by email and on the Roaring Back website on frequently asked questions related to COVID-19 cases and exposure. A faculty and staff training video will be disseminated aimed to ensure that every faculty and staff member understands COVID-19 protocols and their responsibilities in keeping themselves and others safe. Please remember, remember to check the Roaring Back website at isu.edu slash Roaring Back and do that regularly. Important information will be posted there as the situation Evolves. Now, all the work uh, that the university has undertaken this summer has been coordinated by five committees. These are called our Roaring Back Committees. Today we are joined by the chairs of those committees and our Executive Vice President and Provost, Dr. Laura Woodworth Nye. The Employees Operation Committee is chaired by Katie Thomas, Associate Director of Human Resources. The Student and Campus Services Committee is chaired by Dr. Shatran, Dean of Students. The Instruction Committee is, by, is chaired by Blake Beck, Director of the Instruction Technology Resource Center. And the Community Committee is chaired by uh, Chris Boyce, Director of Emergency Management. And then finally, our Health Committee is chaired by Dr. Rex Force, Senior Vice Provost and Vice President for Health Sciences. So we have a number of questions that were pre-submitted by all of you. Um, we'll be asking those shortly, and we'll leave any remaining time for our live Q&A at the end. So in the meantime, feel free to submit any questions via the chat feature. I'll send a chat now to everyone with those instructions. Okay, and now we will turn things over to our panel for our pre-submitted questions. Our first topic today is of six categorized topics um, based on the content that you sent in. Uh, and the first topic is on our current COVID-19 situation. So I'm gonna turn this question over to Rex, and the question is, what is the current status of COVID-19 cases in Bannock County on our campuses and in our regions? Uh, thanks, Jenny. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, the, the current state of affairs um, is obviously changing on a daily basis. Um, each health district has adopted uh, their own sort of response plan. Um, and our health district, District 6, um, has been um, evaluating the status of uh, current cases of COVID um, within our, within our um, county region for the, the health district. As you know, um, the rates of disease are different in different parts of the state. And so our, our Idaho Fall Campus is in a different health district. They have a different plan. And our Meridian Campus is in a different health district with a different plan. Um, the state has basically decentralized. Um, you'll remember when we, when we closed down campus, we were working under the governor's uh, four stages. The, the, the governor's office in the state has essentially decentralized the activity to the different health departments. So um, we're working closely with our local health department uh, for the Pocatello main campus. And then of course, we're also um, under uh, close communication with um, the health districts in uh, our, at our other campuses. It's all pretty confusing. Um, and so what we've done within the, within the COVID health committee is to create um, a, a operational plan that is being reviewed um, by the administrative council tomorrow. Um, that administrative plan um, basically looks like our roaring back plan in reverse. That is how, if the situation gets worse, will we respond as a campus? Um, that's also based upon a variety of different metrics. Um, and the COVID health team has put together an extensive group of metrics to look at our own operational uh, status, the functionality of the institution, 
um, the risk uh, uh, to our students, faculty, and staff, um, the cases on campus, the cases in our communities, as well as a lot of other sort of infrastructure related um, infrastructure related data. So we are sort of looking at the current state of affairs. Um, we have had cases on campus nearly continually since we had the first case uh, in the state on our Meridian campus on March 13th. Last week, uh, we've had about four cases in the campus community. These are all posted on the um, on the Roaring Back, or I'm sorry, the COVID webpage, um, and you can track. Um, the cases as we post those each week um, in the campus community. And that's part of our metrics for uh, our operational status as we look at what's happening obviously on campus. Ginny, I think that's sort of the answer. You got it. In a big nutshell, it was a long answer. <laughs> yes. Um, next question is also for you. Will university numbers be counted separately from Bannock County numbers? So as I said before, we're tracking the university numbers as best we can. And we have a team that's working very closely with the health department for identifying and tracking cases. We also will have um, an online uh, form for staff to um, report cases, as well as our uh, COVID at health.isu.edu email and our COVID hotline. So we are tracking them separately, but they are combined in the county's numbers and the district health department numbers overall when we look at um, what's happening in the greater community. Thank you, Rex. Um, we're gonna turn over to the next theme, which is operational. So the question is, why is the university moving forward to offer in-person instruction given the rise in cases, especially when the case prevalence is much greater now compared to last spring? In addition, why is the university exempt from the guidance that large, ga large gatherings should be limited? And I'm going to turn this one over to our provost, uh, Laura woodworth -Nye. Good morning, Ginny and everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. This, of course, is the question that I get almost every day. And I think I'm going to start with a conversation about the changes that we've implemented to ensure that we have a safe environment. The Roaring Back committees, as you know, have been working all summer on implementing public health measures that, when combined with each of the individual efforts that we know we can take, will promote the safety and well-being of our students and our faculty. Some of these include creating a flexible course schedule for fall that includes a strict six-foot distancing for all courses that remain face-to-face, -face, with the exception of those that have an approved health plan. So we have either face-to-face uh, -face courses that have strict six-foot distancing, or they have had an approved health plan. In addition, face coverings, as you know, are required on campus and in classrooms. We have new sanitation practices in place. And as a result, we're more well positioned to offer limited face-to-face -face courses now than we were in the spring. Now that said, I think I can give you some data that will um, give you a better picture of what it looks like now that we've re-roomed. Our average classroom size at this point after the re-rooming, now this is for face-to-face -face courses, the more traditional face-to-face -face course, is currently at 12.32. So currently at about 12 um, average size for a face-to-face -face course. Our lab studios are at a little over 10 um, average size, and the high flex courses are a little over 11. Now that is um, in a course schedule that's changing. Um, the students are adding, uh, they are shifting their schedules around, so there is some uh, transition in the schedule. But the overall average will likely result in an under 20 number for all face-to-face -face sections um, when we are done with the schedule and the first um, classes begin. In addition, um, as Rex explained, uh, the institution is working with the district health departments to monitor metrics in all of our service regions. New operational plans and levels uh, will be informed by the district's health um, plans, and as a result, uh, could potentially result in different responses from an instructional perspective per campus location. 
As Rex noted, um, at, if we enter one of the levels of high risk, um, there will be impacts uh, such as uh, potentially uh, moving face-to-face -face courses to a distance format. Although the university can never eliminate all risk, these efforts put us, as I mentioned before, in a different position than we were in the spring, where all those proactive and precautionary risk mitigation efforts were not yet available. Higher education, like all education, has been deemed an essential service, and many of our students have indicated that in-person instruction is important to their decision to continue their education. With all the measures we have in place from high flex, distancing, face covering, and sanitation, we feel confident that we've done everything that we can to make the environment as safe as possible. That said, we will continue to review our situation and we will be ready to make adjustments when necessary. And I think uh, that's it for this question, Ginny. Thanks, Laura. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I know you mentioned flexibility, high flex, um, maybe you can go into some detail for us on how Idaho State University is offering a variety of flexible options for students this fall. Yeah, absolutely. So we have, as you all know, synchronous, asynchronous um, courses that are online. Uh, we have distance learning courses that we've had for a long time. Um, the health sciences, for example, have utilized DL uh, for years. Uh, those are still um, on the books, we're calling them blended um, DL at this point uh, in terms of coding in the system. And then we've created a new structure, the high flex course, and that is the only new course type in the system. For high flex courses, as you know, some students will be face to face and some will be online um, at any given time. To ensure a successful start, uh, a successful start to those high flex sections, we're asking faculty to email students before the first day of class to explain uh, what the split is for the first course, because we don't want all of the students to arrive in that course on day one. Now that said, faculty have the option of figuring out how to change those rotations uh, throughout, as long as we are maintaining six foot distancing, um, change those rotations throughout the term to meet the needs of students and to meet the needs of the course and, and also to respond to any level changes that we are experiencing uh, based on the health on the health plans. I can give you a kind of a breakdown of where we are in the course schedule for those types of courses. Uh, right now, um, ISU's course schedule, and we expect this to hold um, basic, essentially, is about 21% online. So 21% of the courses are either synchronous or asynchronous. If you're interested, I can give you the breakdown uh, later. 26% <laughs> of all of our sections are now high flex. Uh, that's a pretty dramatic change. Uh, the earlier online change is not dramatic. Uh, we were already at about 20% online before, we, before COVID. And so we haven't had a huge change in the online. High flex, we only had about 3% of our total sections were high flex prior to COVID. Now we're at 26%. We expect that to continue to increase over time. And then for traditional classroom, um, the traditional classroom lecture environment, uh, we were at about 29% prior to COVID, and now we are at about 15%. So that has obviously been reduced and transitioned to high flex for the most part. The remaining, you'll see that these do not add up to 100%. The remaining sections are labs that have a health plan and thesis dissertation independent study sections. And we have a lot of those, a lot of thesis dissertation sections, of course, because they're individualized. So that gives you an idea of where we've landed on the schedule. It gives us a lot of flexibility it means that if we do um, move between levels, we have a lot of options. Those high flex um, courses have a lot of flexibility, of course. And then the fact that we're already um, approaching 20, 21% uh, fully online uh, gives us a lot of options as well. And that's it, Ginny, for, for additions to that. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate all that detail. Um, the next question is also in the category of operational, and this one is for Rex. Um, what is the plan if COVID-19 becomes widespread on campus? Will campus close? 
So that's a great question. Um, we do have operational levels, as we, as I said earlier, much like we uh, had stages of opening, we have stages of closing that are proposed. Um, if things were to become very, very concerning again, like we had back in uh, April and May, late March, April and May, um, and uh, we needed to, in essence, shelter in place, um, we could move to that category. As I said, we have a variety of metrics that relate to our infrastructure, um, the number of cases on campus, um, the availability of uh, healthcare in the community, of personal protective equipment, uh, we have about nearly 20 different metrics that we look at each week to determine the safety of continuing uh, to have campus open. Um, we provide that scorecard to admin council each week and they will make the determination as to what stage the university is operating in. And as I said, we have four stages. We're currently in the green stage, um, like our district health um, department in Pocatello. Um, however, it's a very different situation in the Treasure Valley where they've just moved to the red stage. And so we will be reconciling the differences in disease activity and other factors between our campuses as we make these decisions. Um, so it is possible that campus could close, Ginny, um, if, if things got uh, bad enough um, and the disease activity was severe enough. We also will notify campus um, as we have cases, particularly clusters, there's some reporting required under the Clery Act. And if we have clusters, those, um, those will be noted um, and there will be campus communication around that. Um, and so that's, that's part of uh, our, um, the number of clusters we're dealing with on campus, the number of students in quarantine, um, the location uh, and um, of cases and the, um, availability of quarantine beds, for example, those are the kinds of things that we're looking at uh, as we move forward, determining the operational status of the campus. Thank you, Rex. Um, and for our next question, so you had mentioned that um, the university is tracking all of our COVID-19 cases on isu.edu slash roaring back slash COVID cases. Um, and maybe you can talk to us a little bit about why it's being done that way. Why is it at the aggregate level? Well, there's um, some confidentiality issues that we um, like to deal with. Um, this is related to HIPAA, um, and uh, for the most part, the individual details of the case are not necessary for everybody to know. Um, we, we will notify people and provide a, a bit more detail um, when we have cases. So for example, if we had a group of cases in one of the residence halls or in a specific course or in a specific department, we would, we would make that, um, avail that information available and communicate that out to campus uh, at, at a greater level of detail. Thanks, Rex. Uh, next question, will the university be testing faculty, staff, or students for COVID-19? So we're not implementing universal testing. Um, universal testing um, is complicated by a variety of factors, um, including how much disease activity you're having in an individual community. Um, the, other, the other factor that has been complicating this is simply testing capacity. And uh, much of the time over the past several months, health systems have just had a difficult enough time keeping up with for example, symptomatic cases, that screening everybody doesn't make sense. Um, screening asymptomatic in individuals is not high yield at the present time. So even though that could provide us a snapshot in time, it doesn't tell us what's gonna happen tomorrow or next week. And um, there would need to be some ongoing asymptomatic testing for that to be useful. We really can't uh, do that because of resources, um, not just expense to the institution, but the availability of the testing equipment, the testing kits, the reagents, all of those things. I will say though that we're working with the state to increase the testing capacity in the campus community. And we've put in an order for uh, a high throughput, uh, what's called PCR testing device that will allow for an additional 500 tests in Southeast Idaho per day. <clears throat> the state has uh, helped uh, to help us procure that and the reagents to be able to run that equipment. And it will be done in partnership with Express Labs, at least that's our plan at the present time, 
Express Labs is the entity that's doing the testing uh, at the Drive Up Testing Center, which has relocated from Dyer Hall up to Holt Arena. Um, they're doing several dozen tests a day there. Um, and we have, uh, I think a, we, we will have an, a very extensive capacity to be able to expand our testing. We also are ordering some uh, what are called antigen testing uh, supplies and equipment. The antigen test is like getting a rapid strep test in your doctor's office or um, a rapid flu test. Um, that test can be available within just 10 or 15 minutes. We'll have limited numbers of our ability to do that, but it, there may be situations where we need to know right away if a test is po if a person is positive. And so that testing uh, will likely be available at the University Health Center. We're also staffing up uh, additional people to do this testing. And we're staffing up additional people to do contact tracing. So that's another part of the infrastructure that we're putting in place right now um, to be able to handle uh, our students coming back in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thank you, Rex. Um, I'm going to post um, where everybody can access the COVID cases on campus again. Um, so if you missed it in the chat earlier, um, this is where you can find it. Uh, additionally, Tell us, Rex, how often will this be updated? And then you mentioned clusters will also be, potential clusters will also be um, reported here. Tell, tell us a little more, more about that. Uh, just on the testing site itself, Ginny, is that what you're referring to? Correct. How often it will be yeah. posted and then what, um, confirming that you will be posting cluster information as well. Right. So on that web page, there's a table. The table uh, puts, puts out um, or depicts uh, each week and our weeks run from Wednesday to Tuesday. We usually update the information on Tuesday uh, afternoon or for sure by Wednesday morning. There will be uh, footnotes or a notes section on that that will denote clusters um, and we will utilize our um, contact tracers and our COVID health team to notify individuals that, that really need to know about clusters. So for example, if something happened in an anthropology course, <clears throat> we would obviously reach out to the instructor, we would reach out to the faculty and staff in that department and the students that might be affected um, by a cluster in an anthropology course, for example. Okay. Thanks, Rex. Um, now we're still in the operational category right now and sorry to pick on you so much, Rex, but this next question is for you as well as chair of our ISU Health Committee. Um, the next question is, if a staff or faculty member tests positive or is symptomatic for COVID-19, are they required to quarantine for two to three weeks? Yeah, thanks. Um, and really, it, it doesn't matter if it's a faculty, a, a, a student, a staff member, the answer is yes. If you're uh, positive for COVID-19, you, um, you do need to isolate. Um, we do quarantine, and it's kind of confusing terminology. Quarantine is used for those to avoid illness, so they're not infected. Isolation is for those who are symptomatic or have tested positive. So those individuals need to isolate. It's not quite for two weeks. It's 10 days, but it depends on the length of their symptoms. And it also, that will affect those around them and how long they need to quarantine. Um, so yes, we follow CDC and uh, health department guidelines. An individual tests positive, they're gonna be uh, placed on isolation. Um, they're gonna be monitored every day um, by the public health department and by, um, and by our COVID health team on campus. Um, we're gonna be uh, elucidating the different symptoms that they have um, and then helping them to determine when they can come back to work based upon those symptoms. Typical course is 10 days of isolation after an individual is symptomatic and they need to have at least 24 hours and these recommendations have changed recently at least 24 hours maybe even 72 hours of improving symptoms and no fever so that's kind of the rules of thumb that we are following if someone uh, on campus and really this is true for anyone who gets covid um, that that we follow and Ginny you just put the slide up that has um, some of those uh, um, uh, criteria for um, returning to work and that sort of thing. Excellent. Thank you, Rex. 
Okay, so what ex walk us through what exactly happens uh, when an employee, student, or faculty member tests positive for COVID-19 or is symptomatic? Well, we'd like to have all of the folks that are symptomatic on campus, um, first of all, disclose that if they're contacted by the health department, right? If their test turns up positive, usually the health department or their primary care provider knows. We want them to notify them that they're a member of the campus community. Obviously, the more information we have and the quicker we have it on campus, we can then respond to keep campus safe. Um, and so uh, we want, we, we would like them to disclose that they're connected with campus, either as a student, faculty, or staff. And we'd like them to self-report um, through either our uh, online form, um, that is our COVID self-report form, or through uh, the COVID at health.isu.edu web, uh, sorry, email, or through our COVID hotline. That allows us to then engage our contact investigators and tracers to then be able to um, notify potential contacts of the right kinds of instructions that they need to have. Um, somebody tests positive, they're gonna go through the process that we just went through. That is, they'll be on uh, isolation for at least 10 days. Um, and if symptomatic, need to have um, improving symptoms uh, before they were to come back to campus, come back to work. Um, those contacts will then be traced and um, notified through our um, COVID health team to then be able to provide them with the right kinds of instruction and the right kind of guidance moving forward. Obviously, we need our faculty to be um, very understanding, I guess, uh, with their attendance policies for students. And we need our supervisors to be understanding about uh, the need for employees to potentially uh, have to quarantine. This is uh, extremely important to limit spread, right? It's why contact tracing is so important. We have to identify the positive cases as quickly as possible, and we have to put the contacts on quarantine to limit the spread of the illness so that we um, don't end up having to move uh, to a to a different operational level on campus and uh, potentially uh, move away from uh, live work and live instruction. Thanks, Rex. And speaking of COVID and instruction, what happens to a class with a confirmed or probable case? In addition, how will cases impact iFlex courses? So, um, faculty and um, students will be notified, but you have to realize that the mitigate, disease mitigation efforts we have in place are really to protect everyone around that possible case. So if people are wearing face coverings, if people are maintaining the six foot distance, the risk to the rest of that classroom is quite low. Um, that's not to say it's absent. It's not to say that there isn't some risk. But the whole point of all the planning and, the, and the, the re rooming of all the courses that Provost Woodworth and I just talked about was to protect everybody in that classroom. From a contact perspective, if I'm in class with you, Ginny, and I am sick and I come to class and find out a day later that my test was positive and you were six feet away and we both used our masks, you're not even technically considered a contact. Does that make sense? You would have to be within that six foot bubble and we would have to have a lack of face coverings um, to, then, to then make that high enough risk for um, contact tracing to kick in. That being said, we will notify faculty um, if a student in their classroom has been positive once we know and uh, faculty um, do not necessarily need to um, and probably shouldn't notify the rest of the class about this because of the reasons we just talked about. The risk is actually quite low if we're maintaining distance and we're wearing our face coverings. It's not zero, but it's pretty close to it. And so um, the faculty does not need to um, notify the other members in the class um, without direction from the COVID Health Committee after we've gathered additional data about the risk uh, associated with that case. So the contact tracing will then kick in We'll figure out who needs to be contacted and who needs to be notified. Um, and uh, like I said, if physical distancing is maintained and face coverings are worn, the rest of that class should be safe and the risk of infection is very, very low. Thank you, Rex. 
Um, oh, we, one, other, one other thing, Jenny. One of the things we might uh, consider doing in, in our classes is developing a seating chart. And if we develop a seating chart, then it will help with contact tracing. If there is a breach in distancing or face the wearing of face coverings, the other uh, point you asked about what might happen to high flex courses, if we were to develop a cluster, if we were to have extensive uh, cases on campus, then we may just move towards um, more distance based education as, as uh, Provost Woodworth and I talked about. Thank you, Rex. Um, two more questions for you, and then we're going to move to the next category. Um, the first of the final two for you for the moment. Uh, if a student or employee stops coming to class or work because they are caring for a sick relative or roommate, what should we do? Well, I think they need to communicate that with their... Sorry, Rex. Um, can you, can, yeah. Would you mind starting over? I accidentally muted you. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. That's fine. Um, I was just saying that communication is the key. So we need to make sure that um, if somebody's caring for somebody, a child or uh, another family member, that kind of thing, um, they need to communicate with their instructor, with their faculty member. They, if it's an employee, they need to communicate that with their supervisor. Um, obviously, um, they need to work on arrangements for telework, whether it's teleschool work um, and online instruction or, or uh, whatever modalities are possible or uh, telework for employees. So um, communication is the key um, for folks to be able to, um, to, to have the flexibility necessary uh, to deal with um, sick relatives or family members, household members. Thanks, Rex. Um, last question before we move to the next category of face covering and shields. Will faculty be notified if a student in their classroom has tested positive for COVID-19 Will other students be notified? And if you, you touched on this, but if you wouldn't mind um, answering that for us. Yeah, so um, our plan is to notify faculty if a student in their class tests positive. Um, we, again, if our disease mitigation efforts are in place, it's probably not necessary unless we develop a cluster in a classroom uh, to notify uh, everybody else of every case, because if we're certain that we've maintained face coverings and have maintained distancing, the risk is extremely low. Um, it's not zero, as I said, but it is extremely low, less than a percent or so if people maintain distance and both individuals are wearing face coverings. So uh, in that situation, um, we're not necessarily gonna broadcast every single case and every location of every case uh, on campus because we should be, um, if we're maintaining the disease mitigation protocols, we should be safe. Okay, thank you so much for that information, Rex. Um, we're gonna come back to you, of course, uh, but right now we're gonna shift to our next uh, category, and that is face covering and shields. Um, the first question, I'm gonna turn to Blake uh, Beck, our chair of the Instruction Growing Back Committee. So the question is, I have heard face shields are being purchased for faculty. Are face shields without wearing a cloth mask underneath effective in stopping COVID? How can a staff member acquire one of these face shields? Thank you. Yeah, the, there is insufficient data at this time to say that a face shield is a substitute for a cloth face covering for most people. Um, however, uh, that we recognize that uh, this may be an acceptable accommodation for those who are medically unable to wear a face covering. Uh, students, faculty, and staff may contact disability services to request an accommodation and have a face mask. Faculty may, but we have also made it a, an exception that faculty may wear a face shield in lieu of a face covering only when lecturing so that they can be better heard in the classroom and, and their face can be seen to create a better experience uh, for those individuals that might need help to see facial expressions or read lips or, or need some kind of ADA accommodation. Uh, these, the distribution of these is in process to the instructors uh, who will be teaching in, in, in person this year. So those should be coming like the face coverings to each faculty member that, uh, that is going to be teaching face to face. And, and then again, I'll just mention, I think this was mentioned before, there is a, you can, the, the face shields are at no cost. You can always submit a request to Bengal Depot if you haven't received yours, but they should be, all of these should be coming out in the next uh, week or so. 
but uh, again, th th it is possible to request one through Bengal Depot as well. Thanks, Black. Blake, sorry, Blake Beck. Okay, I'm gonna um, post the, this uh, that I just sent is the request form for Bengal Depot for PPE supplies. Um, there are also some COVID related decals that our employees can access through this um, form. So next question uh, submitted, this one is gonna be for Katie Thomas, our chair of the employee Warring Back Committee. Are there plans for how people can dispose of used face coverings in campus buildings? How will people be served to use used masks in waste baskets in public? Sure. So face coverings are not actually considered medical waste and therefore they don't need to be disposed of in a specific manner. So the disposable face coverings can be thrown in the regular trash receptacles, just like napkins or paper towels or any other disposable items. Perfect. Thanks, Katie. Next question. I'm going to turn this over to um, Craig, our Dean of Students. And the question is, what if a student refuses to wear a facial covering during class? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for this question. Uh, so first, faculty members should communicate uh, at the very beginning of the semester that face coverings are required. Uh, I think we're, we're communicating that in a number of different ways to, uh, to our students. The faculty members should communicate that about their own classes. Uh, and if a student shows up at class without a face covering, a faculty member can offer them a disposable face covering if one's available. Um, but if a student just flat out refuses to wear a face covering, uh, the faculty member should ask the student to leave the classroom. Uh, this is one of the reasons that we're asking faculty members to uh, record their classes and their lectures. Uh, students will be able to access that material uh, through an, an online forum. Um, if the student refuses to leave the classroom, uh, faculty members can cancel the class for the day uh, and for that particular class session, move it to uh, distance learning. And then of course, faculty members can report uh, to the Dean of Students office, uh, students who are, are flat out refusing to wear face coverings and we can help problem solve with faculty members or we can intervene uh, with faculty members in those situations. Thank you, Craig. Um, I'm also going to post um, a face covering toolkit for faculty. Um, so this is also available on our Warren Back site, but this is the direct link for everyone. So next question, um, I'm gonna turn this one, back, uh, bounce this one back to Katie. What if an employee will not wear a face covering? Sure, thanks. So as basically everyone else has mentioned before me, face coverings are a really important part of helping our campus resume and continue operation. So it's one of those basic six things that we're asking everybody campus-wide to do. Um, so if an employee comes to work without a face covering, they should be offered a disposable one, similar to what Craig just said for students. And if you need access to disposable face coverings, you can submit a request through that Bengal Depot order form and get some from Bengal Depot if you need them. Um, we've also developed a manager toolkit for face coverings that can help supervisors and employees navigate conversations so how to reiterate expectations, how to discuss solutions um, if, if there's a situation. If somebody is medically unable and um, requests an accommodation, we can work with disability services for more assistance in that area. But if the employee continues to just flat out refuse um, and will not wear the face covering, then you can go ahead and contact Human Resources and we can talk through situations on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think, Jenny, can you post the link to the face covering toolkit in the chat box. You bet. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. Um, we're going to move to our next uh, category, which is remote accommodations. And I'm going to stick with Katie for this question. Are staff able to work remotely or will they be required to work in person? Sure, good question. So managers and supervisors are encouraged to be as flexible as possible with employees to accommodate remote work and telecommuting um, agreements and applications wherever practical. So I understand that given the nature of certain positions and certain tasks, there are some that need to be completed on, on campus and in person, um, given the nature of the task. And we've had a lot of essential employees like uh, facilities and public safety and a lot of student affairs employees who have remained on campus to continue work even through the university closure. So I know, I know this is a, a tough situation, but the university has and will be 
continue to be committed to the safety of employees while working on campus, making in-person work as safe as possible um, in conjunction with the individual efforts of all of our employees. So it really, it really falls on each individual to follow these six basic practices. And again, you'll, you've probably heard these a lot and you'll hear them over and over and over that these six practices, um, while we can't completely eliminate the risk, following these safe practices like Rex mentioned can really help reduce the risk of COVID exposure and outbreak. So this is the maintaining at least six feet of physical distance, wearing the face covering indoors on any ISU campus and outdoors when in the proximity of others, um, staying home if you or someone in your house is sick, washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds as frequently as possible and using hand sanitizer when, when you can't wash your hands, covering your coughs and sneezes into your sleeve or elbow, and not shaking hands, hugging, um, things like that, and then regularly cleaning high touch surfaces. So trying to make, um, make access or make sure everybody has access to all those cleaning supplies through that COVID supplies ordering form too. So departments can, can have hand sanitizer on hand, have disposable face coverings on hand, um, and have sanitizing supplies to clean those high touch surfaces. Thanks, Lee. Um, the next one is also for you. What do I do if I am being required to work in person, but I'm not comfortable with that? Yeah, I know this, this is tough and it's a really difficult time for everyone um, on our campus and other campuses and other workplaces across the nation. So first of all, if you're part of a vulnerable population and therefore at higher risk for severe complications from COVID, please let your supervisor know and um, work with HR and disability services where needed to discuss remote work or accommodations. Um, other than that, the university is following CDC and health department regulations and guidelines to help mitigate the threat as best we can, like we discussed in the six, the six principles. So asking all individuals on campus, be it faculty, staff, students, or our visitors and guests, to follow those six practices. We've also worked on, as Laura mentioned earlier, rearranging spaces to support physical distancing. We've installed plexiglass barriers and reworked spaces and waiting areas um, to ensure physical distancing is possible. Jenny, you mentioned those decals that are available through Bengal Depot that um, departments can use in waiting areas and things like that to maintain physical distance. Um, additionally, we're making sure all employees have access to face coverings, sanitizing supplies, and we're setting strong expectations for faculty, staff, and students to follow all of these prevention guidelines. So um, if you're concerned, please talk with your supervisor about your specific concerns. So there may be a situation where between you and your supervisor, you can brainstorm a solution. So if it's a, a specific task that you're concerned about one aspect of the task or a certain situation, work with your supervisor and things, think, if, think if there are other ways that that task can be done um, more safely or in, in utilizing some of those practices in a different way. Um, so sometimes through these discussions of particular situations, there can be an additional protocols offered to a certain task to make you more comfortable. Um, and if you need assistance to discuss specific situations, feel free to talk with your leadership, reach out to HR, or we can loop in um, input from the COVID health team. So if there's a specific situation that you're concerned about, we can work with them to sort of see how that can be addressed in a different way or a, or a safer manner. Thank you, Katie. Um, last question for you in this category. Can ISU offer any resources to the community for those parents who want to homeschool their children this fall? Yeah, good, good question. This is a tough one. So obviously ISC can't advise on what's best for every child in every educational situation. And I know there's, there are many parents facing the questions as schools statewide are discussing plans for either reopening in person or online. Um, so if day, daycare or school services aren't available due to COVID outbreaks or closures, employees should work with their supervisors to discuss alternatives. Um, to figure out what may be appropriate. In some cases, remote work or telework may be appropriate to meet the need of that situation. And if remote work isn't a possibility, where there are still a variety of leave options available that um, supervisors can work with HR and the employee to explore what are the best leave options for the given situation. Okay, thank you, Katie. Next category is high flex learning and distance learning. Um, this first question I'm going to uh, turn to Craig. Are there physical spaces where students can go to take online or high flex courses if they are not able to do so from home? 
students will be able to use uh, all the physical spaces on campus for online or high flex courses. And so if, if a student has a device that connects to Wi-Fi, really anywhere on campus can be used for their online or high flex course. Uh, likewise, our computer labs are going to be open. And so, uh, and, and they've already been set up in a, in a safe physical distance manner. And so students will be able to use our computer labs. And also students will be able to check out Chromebooks uh, from the help desk on the second floor computer lab of Rendezvous. And so there's a, a couple different options for, for students. They can come to our computer labs, they can check out a Chromebook or use their own devices on our Wi-Fi. Thanks, Greg. Um, for the second question, I'm gonna to turn to Blake. Do courses have to be recorded? Do our faculty members have to record their courses? Okay, uh, faculty are being asked to record lectures to ensure that all the students can access course materials, even if they are sick or in quarantine, so that we don't encourage students in some way to come to class when they're ill or in, there's some question of exposure. Um, so faculty need to be mindful of privacy issues and, and have the right to record or not re record um, what they're doing, but the essential information probably should be recorded in all instances so that students can stay involved. Faculty do have the right to determine what that is, but this semester, maybe more than any other, we, we, it's gonna be important that faculty consider how to keep students engaged when we're encouraging them to stay home if they have illness or expo you know, exposed at home or any other reason. We're gonna have, uh, we're encouraging them to stay home and recording is, and providing recordings uh, will be a, one of the many ways to try to help keep them engaged. So the answer is, it's a faculty decision, but it is being strongly encouraged so that we can keep everybody engaged. Thank you, Blake. Okay, next up is other. So there are a few um, questions that um, weren't categorized with the rest. And the first is, what is the status of the parking situation on the Meridian campus? Is the new lot open? And I'm gonna to turn to Katie for this answer. Sure, so what I've heard, um, according to Public Safety and Meridian, the new parking area should be available and open next week. Uh, that said, if there's anyone else on here from Meridian that has a more updated bit of information, please feel free to throw it in the chat. Thank you, Katie. Um, next question, I'm gonna give this one to Craig. I'm a club advisor. What will be happening with clubs this year? What changes can we expect and how shall I advise my club officers? First off, thank you for advising one of our clubs. We know uh, student involvement in clubs and organizations is an, an absolutely critical piece of, of the student experience. So thank you for, for helping provide that opportunity for our students. We want as many students to be involved in, in campus clubs and organizations as possible this year. Um, but it, it is, of course, going to look a little bit different. I think the biggest change that advisors and club officers can expect are any type of events that clubs and organizations want to hold. Uh, if, if a club or organization wants to host an event, they're going to need to do so in a way that observes physical distancing, the wearing of face coverings, and limiting the uh, number of attendees at most events. Uh, it's going to be a big change for, for some of our student organizations, but that's what we're going to be asking them to do. Um, if there's uh, clubs or organizations that typically travel, um, that's something else that might uh, be impacted this year. And we're going to ask advisors to work with the uh, Leadership and Engagement Center on, on any type of student club or organization travel this year. Thanks, Greg. Next question. Um, so there are many people out there that believe that COVID-19 is not a serious public health issue and that face masks should not be required. How is the university responding to that? And for this one, I'm gonna to turn to Laura. Oh, thanks, Judy. So two main points here. Um, number one, the university's position is that COVID is a serious threat to our community, which is why we've put into place all of these mitigation efforts and planning efforts. And number two, Safety is a shared duty. We have a duty to each other and to our campus to maintain all of the safeguards that we put into place and to model those behaviors. And we certainly talked a lot about what those are um, today, 
a six foot distancing, uh, wearing a face covering, a staying home if you are not feeling well, sanitation regulations, etc. I want to talk about just two um, issues that we haven't said a whole lot about uh, relative to that uh, in relationship to this question. Uh, one that we do have health plans, as I mentioned, for a lot of our courses that have face-to-face -face requirements or are in lab, specialized lab environments with course outcome requirements that cannot maintain six foot distancing. In those cases, those health plans have been approved or in, are in the process of being approved by our health committee. And it's absolutely imperative that faculty follow those health plans. We um, have had some instances over the summer where um, we didn't have full compliance for the health plans and we feel good about the processes that we put, put into place to make sure that that occurs. But it's really important for all of us to adhere to all of the restrictions that apply in our individual situation or for the campus as a whole. If you are uncomfortable, if you do encounter a situation with another employee or with a student uh, that has made you uncomfortable, we do have the toolkits uh, that Ginny has posted. But also, please reach out to HR if you're starting to uh, feel that this is a situation that uh, you need support for managing. And Katie uh, mentioned that already, of course. But the key components of this is that the institution is taking this very seriously. We continue to monitor our health environment and that safety is a shared duty. And I think um, that that takes care of that question, Ginny. Thank you, Laura. So we're going to turn over now to some of our live Q&A. Um, we honestly have quite a few questions submitted. So what we're going to do is get through as many as we can in the next nine minutes. Um, and then I will use these questions uh, to prep for our next town hall um, as the submitted questions for our next town hall on COVID, which will be August 12th at 1 p.m. Um, that is also in the email that the university sent out um, along with the link and the password for the 12th. So um, all that to say too, if you please join us in the next one if you're free. And um, if you need your question answered sooner, um, you can absolutely email me and I will um, get an answer for you. So um, I'm gonna start with the first uh, submitted question today. And um, that question will be for Rex. So the question is, I'm wondering how ISU will deal with the issue that it is taking 10 to 14 days to get COVID test results back in Bannock County. How should we as faculty deal with this delay? So that is a really difficult situation and it's a good question. Um, the delays are down significantly and through our Express Labs uh, testing center, um, we're having uh, right now about a three day turnaround. Um, the delays uh, or the pending tests are down significantly from where they were a few weeks ago. That doesn't mean that every laboratory and every testing methodology uh, or modality is going to be um, quick turnaround. Um, and obviously quick turnaround allows for quick decisions to be made and contact tracing to be made uh, better in a timely manner. So um, one of the things that we are doing is trying to stand up a greater testing capacity. Um, and I'm not sure if you were on earlier when, when we talked about this, but we're purchasing um, equipment to provide 500 tests a day. In addition, some very rapid turnaround tests, some antigen testing will be available at University Health. We're hoping to have this in place um, later in August. Great, thanks Rex. Um, this next question I'm gonna to turn to Craig. Who is responsible for policing and enforcing mask wearing in the more public spaces such as Reed Gym, Rendezvous, and the sub? Our hope is that um, through a lot of the education that we're doing, students, faculty, and staff will uh, be voluntarily wearing face coverings and, and compliant with everything that we're, we're asking them to do. Uh, I think any member of our community can ask somebody not wearing a face covering uh, to, to please put one on. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the, the best ways is that community peer support uh, to, to try to get folks to wear face coverings. Um, and then also the, the staff in those areas uh, can also be asking people to wear face coverings. Um, it's, it's something that's going to take 
everyone on our campus to, to do. Uh, we are asking people to be compassionate with one another. We're asking people to um, make decisions for the good of the community. Um, and so it, it, it really is a, a community uh, responsibility, but we will have, we also have staff in those areas who, who can be asking people to wear face coverings as well. Thank you, Craig. Next question, um, I'm gonna point this one to Laura. What are options for those faculty who are in the high-risk group who are assigned to teach in-person courses, such as laboratory courses, especially when it is not possible to be, to be reassigned or go online? Well, first of all, I wanna just um, point out that we have already asked um, deans and chairs to work with faculty who are in, in high-risk situations and my preference is that those faculty be assigned to a fully online opportunities when that is not possible and we know because of our our program mix that there are some situations where high-risk faculty are teaching in some of these face-to-face -face courses that i mentioned before that have a health plan in those cases the health plan really needs to be um, managed uh, with the fact in mind that that faculty member is in a high risk population. So the health plans need to take that into account and the health team uh, needs to work with the chair and the faculty member to ensure that we're comfortable with the health plan. Now that said, there are gonna be some cases where we've gotta figure out a different solution. And if, if there are situations where these processes are not functioning, uh, please reach out to the provost's office and we can help manage those lo the logistics around that. Uh, there are options, I mean, even in face-to-face -face, um, required courses, and, and you know, I'm thinking of things like nursing or physical therapy. Uh, we obviously have more of those types of courses than most institutions do, but there are solutions that we can work in an innovative way to come up with that can certainly minimize the contact and perhaps the faculty member does not need to be there every day. And so those are the kinds of mitigation plans that we are requesting that all the deans and chairs work on in those cases. If you're running into problems, if you feel that these logistics are not working, um, please reach out to the provost office and we will work with the health team to come up with a, a better solution. Perfect, thank you, Laura. So this next question, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Rex. Are there any rules about field trips, i.e. can we have students instructors in the cars together? So there are some rules around travel, um, and those, tra those travel rules change a little bit depending on which operational level that we're in. Um, we typically do not, um, do not want multiple individuals in vehicles for extended periods of time. Um, and we can look at those on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I think if that kind of travel is uh, expected or required, we need to have a health exception plan in place, and that should be submitted and reviewed by the, the health team. Great. Thanks, Rex. Um, our next question, uh, this might be our last one. Um, I want to turn it over to um, Blake, and the question is, how can we um, see or understand how many students are allowed in each of our classrooms? So facilities went through all of the classrooms and created what we started calling a COVID capacity. Uh, the scheduling office uh, took that information and incorporated it into the class schedule. So there is a COVID capacity for every room on campus and I think if you look at the class schedule uh, you'll be able to see what the COVID capacity is in that room. Uh, if you have a specific question about a specific classroom feel free to email me and I can definitely get you a, an answer about that particular classroom what that capacity is. Great, thanks Blake. Okay, so um, we're going to wrap up there, and um, I want to again say that any question that was not answered today, we will use as pre-submitted questions for our next uh, COVID Town Hall, which is, again is on Wednesday, August 12th at 1 p.m., um, and the information should be in the email that was sent from the university about our two COVID Town Halls. 
Um, and then also, again, if you have a question that you need more urgently answered, you can send that directly to me and I will help you find an answer. Um, I just want to thank all of our panelists uh, for taking the time to answer all of our questions and thank all of you for attending. Um, we very much appreciate your attention um, to this topic and we look forward to communicating with you as we move forward. Um, one last thing, we are recording this and it will be posted on isu.edu slash town hall for anybody who missed it. Um, so if any of your colleagues uh, were unable to attend, uh, know that we'll have that up within the next 48 hours or so.